Hello everyone. Today's lesson will be about creating the horse's tail and mane. We will learn how to work with the physics blender engine, see how the cloth simulation works on the simplest examples, and how even the simplest simulation can help create a fairly complex surface deformation effect, as well as create a hairstyle using the hair system. But before we start, let's check how the tissue simulation system works in Blender. For this, we will use simple geometry. I created a cube and plane with a little split. The plane will act directly as the fabric and the box will act as the kind of obstacle with which the fabric will interact. So to make cloth from the plane, we need to go to physics properties tab and apply cloth operator. And now when we turn on the animation, our fabric will fall. Now highlight the box and apply the collision operator and play the animation again. So we have a tissue simulation that interacts with a certain subject. If we look at the setting of the fabric parameters, we will see that its behavior is governed by an enormous amount of parameters. The two most important points are stiffness value and damping. These parameters can control different types of behaviors, such as tissue stretching, or making it more dense and not bendable. Also, the behavior of the fabric is affected by the amount of geometry and the type of topology. Notice how much weave behaves differently with more dense mesh. So the values of the simulation parameters are always chosen in relation to topology. Notice that during the simulation, the tissue begins to penetrate itself. To correct this, in the settings of the fabric parameters, go to the Collisions tab. And there we activate the Self Collisions function. This way, when simulating, the cloth will calculate the collision with itself. It looks much more realistic. But it complicates the calculation of simulation. So, on a denser mesh, simulation time for Self Collisions can double or triple. This is the price of making things realistic. One of the useful features in simulation is the ability to isolate certain portions of the geometry from the simulation so that we can leave them immobile. To do this, we're going to choose a small area of geometry. In our case, I choose a strip along the edge and a row of arbitrary points and create a vertex group. Press Assign to apply it to the highlighted area. And in the Fabric Settings, in the Shape tab, I specify our group in the Pin Group tab. Now let's turn on the animation and let's see. Now our simulation is calculated considering the fixed zones. This method is convenient for making curtains or flags. This is how our simulation looks with fixed points and collision object. But often this behavior is not enough and we somehow need to manage the fixed area. and have the ability to animate position and rotation. To do this, highlight our fixed area, select Hooks in the Vertex tab, and click Hook to New Object. A new locator element appeared in our scene. Hook Modifier appeared on the Fabric Geometry in Modifiers, which automatically linked with the locator. Now let's run the animation and try to manipulate the fabric. As you can see, right now the tissue is not responding in any way to the locator movement. This is due to the order in which modifiers are applied. In this case, it's very important that the hook modifier is above the cloth modifier. It has to do with the order in which operations are performed before simulations are calculated. Now let's play the animation and try again. As you can see, we've got quite an interactive object that we can control during the simulation. But I should mention that this approach with simulation management will inevitably lead to errors. Therefore, the more correct thing to do would be to animate the locator and then apply the simulation. Also note that after the cloth modifier, you applied a subdivision modifier. With it, you can make a smoother surface without recalculating the entire simulation on a denser mesh. What we need to know before the beginning of work is the deformation of one geometry with another. 
To our original setup, I will add Torus. And I'll apply the surface deform modifier to Torus. I set the target parameter to our fabric and I press bind. Our Tor now is fully replicating the behavior of the fabric. Thus, on the fabric, you can glue the geometrical ornaments and drawings. The most important function of this is to replace the lowly detailed simulation surface to a more highly detailed one. That is, you can do a simplified geometry of the clothing, simulate it, and at the end apply it to a more detailed geometry of the clothes. And now back to our main scene. And let's proceed to create the tail. The first thing I'm going to do is put the tail into original position. To make it more convenient, I'll select a group of polygons. Cursor to selected. And now in object tab, set origin, choose origin, then 3D cursor. So it will be much easier to manipulate the object. Now copy our items and put them in the right position. I'll make some bundles of our strips. In each of the bundles, there are four or five elements. So I made a variation on the turn and on the scales of the elements. I placed the beams one on top of the other in roughly staggered order. Now I'm going to make a strip of fabric for each of the bundles. They will be as drivers for the tail. Now we need to decide how hard to break the strip of fabric. As we saw earlier, the larger the topology, the more detailed the fabric behaves. This is probably good for soft, thin materials. But in our case, this is leather that is pretty rough and thick, so this amount probably won't work for us. If we divide our strip into a small number of segments, it's more likely that the behavior of this simulation would be like rubber, very dense and rough. So I'm going to stop at some average result of about 14 to 16 segments. In the end, I got this design. I got this kind of construction. The three bundles, named A, B, and C, that I put in the collection, and three drivers with corresponding letter designations. Each of the drivers is in the center of its bundle so that the following deformation is calculated more smoothly. I also strongly recommend that when creating a variety of sets to create elements with the correct names and split them into collections. That way you will not get confused during the simulation setup. I will now create an empty cube which will act as the hook. I'll set it in the tail region and with the size setting I will change the size to a more acceptable one. I specifically used this parameter instead of scaling the object because it could have led to some errors during the calculation of the simulation. At each of the drivers I will create a hook modifier. And for each driver I will make a pin group at the base of the tail. Now you can apply the cloth modifier to each driver. And in each cloth modifier, specify our pin group. Now we can turn on the animation to see how our simulation looks. As you can see, the material looks pretty thin and not resilient. And I would like to feel the density of the material and keep the shape. Now I'll tell you the next settings of our fabric strip. And of course, you will need the same settings for the other two. Let's change the bending value. Let's make this value around 50. We can see that when we play the animation, this strip is starting to hold its shape more. But at the same time, the surface begins to vibrate. In an attempt to improve our result, we can raise its value even higher. But you can see the higher you raise this value, the more our surface shakes. Accordingly, raising to infinity is not an option. 
Now let's try to reduce estimated mass. It would make it much easier to hold the bending value. To get rid of the vibration, let's increase the quality steps value. After experimenting with the settings, I came to the following conclusion. That the simulation looks pretty good at these values. Quality steps 20, vertex mass 0.12 kilograms, and bending value from 80 to 100. These parameters allow me to keep a pretty intense, beautiful shape. Before further work, I will set up hook modifier on each driver and specify pin group. Object tail hook empty. You can now do the surface deform for each tail bundle and adjust it in this manner as was shown at the beginning of the lesson. It's time to look at the final animation. As we can see, the result is not bad at all. The shape looks right and quite natural. The only thing to complain about is that the geometries of the tail bundles penetrate one another. But this is the inevitable cost of the simplicity setups. More complex and natural behavior in Blender could be achieved with using additional plugins. But since it's not our task to make an ultra accurate simulation, we will assume that such a result is acceptable. During the simulation, the geometry of the tail appears so close to the horse's body or the accompanying elements. To avoid penetration, let's create simplified collision objects. That is, a form that will describe a surface in a simplified way. That kind of geometry will be much easier to calculate than the original surface. For the ring, at the tail, I'll use a regular cylinder. And put a collide modifier on it. You saw it at the beginning of the lesson. Next stage, we have to check the simulation in dynamics i.e. to see how the tail behaves not just when hanging down, but also when it spins from side to side. So that the cloth modifier doesn't disturb us, we disable it during the animation. Now you can do a simple animation. Let's set the timeline slider to approximately the 40th frame. Put the key at the z-axis by pressing on the dot next to it. And put a few more keyframes on the timeline indicating on each of them an arbitrary rotation angle. Switch the display to graph editor. Centering the position of the main on the screen and you can correct the position of the points on the curve. To get the sinusoid. Preferably the last key should be in zero value Z position. Activating the cloth modifier back, let's take a look at the result of the simulation. As we can see, even in the rotation, stripes behave quite well, but penetrate heavily into the horse's body. So I'll do some more collision objects which will describe the back part of the horse, the neck and the belly, and do it like this. Because later on, these volumes can be easily connected to the system of the bones and get the necessary collision during the animation. Now play the animation and make sure that everything works well. The dynamic test shows that the behavior is a little rubbery and the tail bounces are a little long and it wobbles after it stops. This happened because we formed the appearance of the tail with bending value, which does not allow the fabric to bend more freely. In fact, every strip of leather should be more malleable and bend more easily. And that kind of tail shape is formed not because of the density of the material, but because of the amount of leather elements compressed in one knot. They hold each other without letting them bend too much. 
So let's try to repeat this effect again. In order to do that, we need to create a map of the weights on the vertices, which will control the impact strength of the bending value. Let's create another vertex group. Give it a logical name and highlight the row of polygons near the tail. I'll highlight the one where the bend occurs and assign a new vertex group. Now switch to weight paint mode. And by selecting blur function, we just blur the vertex group values so that the bending parameter is applied more smoothly. And do the same on the other drivers. When the work on the scales is done, let's move on to the cloth setup. In the property weights tab, we can find the bending parameter where we can specify our group, which we specifically created for this purpose. Below, we can adjust the max bending values, which will be forcibly assigned to the selected group. Thus, the basic meaning of bending can be significantly reduced by specifying a value of 20 or even lower. Now, if we play the animation, we can see that the bending of the curvature remains about the same, but the behavior is not as bouncy as before and it looks more like leather. Last thing worth mentioning. Regarding simulations and how we can keep our simulation into a file or work with versions of the simulation, which is very convenient in case of complex setup behavior or when working with huge and complex projects. If you try to play the simulation in Blender, you may notice that it only looks correctly when playing frames forward. But if we start moving the timeline slider all over the frames, you may find that the geometry starts to break down. This happens because the simulation is calculated from the previous frame. If there is no such information, the geometry is interpolated from the nearest one. At the bottom of the timeline, we can see the blue strip. It is the strip of the preliminary cache. Playing each frame in Blender writes information to the buffer from which it will read it and play. And if we shift the strip a lot, then there is no buffer information and our simulation breaks down. In order to be able to play our simulation in all directions, there is a caching system for the simulation. This caching also helps with resource intensive simulations that cannot be played in real time. All cache settings are in tissue simulation settings. A white symbol marks the cache version. We can create versions and compare the settings in each of the versions. Start and end simulation setup specifies the range where the simulation will be cached. To record cache, we need to press bake. If we want to record the simulation for the selected object or bake all dynamics for all objects in the scene. Let's press bake all and wait for the process to complete. Recorded cache is displayed with a dark blue bar. And now we have an opportunity to play the simulation in all directions. To create another version of the cache, we click on a plus sign and we create another cache file. Now let's randomly change any parameters and write down some more cache. The second simulation we got is pretty strange. But for a demonstration of the principles of work, it is enough. And now we have an opportunity to move on to one cache or the other. Comparing different versions of the settings and achieving the best results. When the cache is written, the whole settings panel is not active and to make any changes, we need to delete the current cache. To do this, we press delete all bakes and select the cache option directly. Only in this case, Blender updates the simulation display. Although it's possible that this is a feature of version 3.0, it is important to note that the cache simulation is written to the body of the files, and thus increasing the project and in many cases slowing down performance. Our project is small and we don't notice it, but in large projects it can play a big role. So in order not to keep the cache inside the project, in Blender there is the ability to save the cache to the hard drive. To do this we use the disk cache command. Select, if necessary, compression method, and in the same way, 
we write the cache of the whole simulation. Now I guess we finish our work on the simulation. You can complicate the behavior of the tail by creating the driver for each individual strip of leather. Such a simulation would look much more natural and expressive. But in our project, I'm going to stop with this result. Well, now let's get down to creating a main. There are several approaches to creating hair on the surface of the geometry. Technically, nothing is stopping us from creating hair directly on our horse's geometries, but this way somewhat limits what we can do. So we go another way. I create a geometry on which the main will be located, make a medium density geometry and project it on the surface of the horse, so that our geometry exactly replicates the original surface. Now let's create hair on the prepared geometry. Let's go to the particle tab properties and click on a plus sign. In this way, we create particles that can switch to the hair mode. To create the basic hairstyle, let's look at the original concept and start by changing the length of the hair in hair length parameters. As you can see, our hair length is a little out of line of the original concept. And to not paint special masks restricting hair growth, we just change the geometry. By adjusting the geometry, we can move on to hair adjustment. Now in viewport, the hair guides are displayed, the amount of which is given by the numbers parameter. The guides are the main guidelines which we can influence both procedurally as well as using combing techniques, about which we'll talk a little later. The guides are already a hair's breadth, but we control the work during the combing and not to work with a huge amount of hair. Interpolation techniques are used. On the children tab, let's turn on the interpolated mode. So we created a lot more hair and now the guides don't affect the density of the hair, but only the shape. And the density is controlled by the display amount parameter and render amount. The greater the number of guideposts, the smoother the interpolation process. As you can see, the hair now looks very straight. Now let's see what the hairstyle would look like with a smaller number of guides, in the neighborhood of 50. Now let's increase the display amount, and we can already see that with such huge values, it does not look so uniform. So the number of guides should be acceptable for smooth interpolation and for combing work. In our case, I'm going to stop at a number of 200 guides. The hair system in Blender is arranged like this. Before we start editing the hair in Edit Particle mode, the Emission tab settings will be active, which is helpful when adjusting the hair. And if we use a set of tools from Edit Particles mode, then we'll have to do without these settings. So let's try to adjust the length and shape of the hairstyle without using edit particles. At least for now. We'll use textures to do that. To control the shape of the hairstyle, in textures tab, let's create a new map. Let's give it a clear naming convention. And on the geometry, make sure that there is a UV coordinate. Now in the textures tab of the list, choose blend. This is the gradient map we're in now. Editing the length of the hairstyle, to apply it to our hair, let's go to the Influence tab. Activate Hair Length Channel. We already see the result, but the given direction is wrong. So in the Mapping tab, switch the coordinate system from the generated to UV. Now turn on the concept geometry display and try to adjust the length of the haircut according to our concept. Under the color tab, let's turn on color ramp mode. Switch the interpolation type to B spline. And now creating the checkpoints and changing the value at each checkpoint, let's try to align our hairstyle by concept. As you can see, I ended up with a pretty accurate appearance. Throughout the process of combing, I had the thought that I was doing something wrong. And the thing is, having the experience with hair work, I know that the guides are generated relative to the normals of polygons. 
I was alarmed by the fact that the direction of the hair was strictly forward. Trying to find the reason for this behavior, I figured it out. Always update all object transforms. Otherwise, you will run into huge problems at the end. But I'll realize it later. So let's keep adjusting. So that the hair doesn't look like a brush, we need to add a little bit of randomness to it. Increase the endpoint value in the roughness tab. That moves our upper points to random direction. We will make noise to uniform parameter on the hair. And the size parameter affects the size of the noise. These values should be chosen very carefully because they are extremely sensitive. You could also try to gather the hair at the base to make it look like bundles. To do this, in the clumping parameter, we change the clump value to a negative range. And this is the part where I realized what I was doing wrong. Notice how the hairstyle was changed since the update. But thank goodness for me. I found this problem only at this stage. If I had realized it later, most likely I would have had to redo my hair. When I got to the point of editing, the hairstyle of the basic parameters is no longer enough. I'm moving on to particle edit mode and using comb brush to make my hair look more interesting. With gentle movements, I will make a small forelock above the forehead. Now I'm pretty happy with the result of the haircut. So let's move on to the shader setup and rendering. Switch to shading editor mode and create a new basic shader at geometry where the hair is located. The surface type we switch to principled hair BSDF. And in the hair setting, make sure that the right material is active. If necessary, you can create several materials, one of which will be used for shading the surface and the second one for shading the hair. So this feature is extremely useful. Let's turn on Cycles Render and see the result. Now let's adjust the principled hair shader. It is based on several principles of creating color for hair. Direct coloring mode is the easiest and most physically incorrect, but allows to set the most incredible colors. The other two methods are based on physical models. Spectral analysis models of hair and a biological model based on melanin content in hair. Both of these models are extremely useful in creating physically correct renderings. But now we're interested in a more artistic approach. So we'll leave the direct coloring. Put some bright color to make the hair look more cartoonish. Now let's zoom in radial roughness value. It will give more shine on her hair and will give to it more plastic look. Now let's create a color ramp and hair info. In this map we can pick different attributes on the hair and use them in shading. Let's plug in intercept in color ramp. And the color ramp can be plugged right into the surface to see the gradient values without shading. This way we can create any kind of color gradient with which our hair will be colored. Next we will create a map range in which we connect the values from random. It outputs random value for each hair. Via map range we can select a certain range of hair. Use RGB mix gradient color, plug in the first input, a map range to value of mixing. So that we can do a little percentage of hair, just white or set them a certain color. With the same color gradient and range map, we can lighten the ends of the hair. Connect them via node math. Set multiply in blend mode.
That's how we got the needle-like white tips. Connect this map to the mix node in the add mode. And if the values are not enough, make the map more contrasting. We can add the color into the randomness value via multiply to make it a bigger variation. If the final rendering looks quite highlighted, the light can be corrected with bright contrast. or by node saturation. Another nuance became visible during rendering. Our hair is pretty thick at the base, and if there is a lot of it, it starts to just overlap each other. Because of this, detailization can be lost. On the tips, it looks like needles. Which looks pretty weird, too. To correct this, in the hair setup, there is a tab for hair shape. Where we can start by increasing the thickness of the hair at the tips. and turn off the close tip feature so that the hair doesn't seem as sharp as a needle on the end of it. And now with diameter scale parameters, we reduce the overall thickness of the hair. That's how the hair looks better and more detailed. As you can see, our shader turned out quite easy to operate and convenient for all sorts of color experiments. At this stage, we will pause work on the shader, and if necessary, we can make the final correction at the final stage of assembling the video. And that's all. Bye, everyone.